Hello, everyone. I'm Pedro A. Guerrero, co-founder of the Alumni Society and proud member of Angeles Investors. I want to welcome all of you to the new Wealth Creation Series developed in partnership between the Alumni Society and Angeles. The Alumni Society was founded to bring together successful leaders who shared both a cultural affinity and the distinction of having graduated from some of the country's top academic institutions. The belief was that by finding these commonalities, we could establish meaningful connections that could serve as a catalyst for advancement, both for the individual and Latinos collectively. And that is what also drew me to Angeles Investors. I was attracted to the promise of coming together with colegas to pool our capital and invest in Latino founders. Given that many members of Angeles are also members of the Alumni Society, and that both organizations care deeply about the advancement of Latinos in general, a partnership between the two networks was only natural. We also have a shared belief that investing in our community is the most effective way to align our investment goals with our passions and the surest way to build generational and communal wealth. And that is the purpose of our wealth creation series. We wanna hear from successful investors who are members of both networks so we can learn from their investment strategies and grow together. We hope you find these conversations valuable and that you continue to be engaged with the Alumni Society and also join Angeles. So here's our agenda for today. After an introduction to our guest speakers by David Olivencia, founder of Angeles, our panelists Adela Cepeda and Luis Oviñas will engage in a conversation about their life journeys and perspectives on wealth. Then we'll deep dive into building generational wealth and investment strategies. We'll then open it up for a Q&A and then bring David back on stage to close out the program. With that, I'd like to introduce my friend David Olivencia, Managing Director at Accenture, proud Alumni Society member via Notre Dame MBA, member of the Board of Directors of WTTW, board member of the National Museum of Mexican Art, co-founder of Hitech, and of course, co-founder of Angeles Investors. David, take it away. All right, Pedro, thank you. And thank you for that great introduction. And thank you for all that you, the Alumni Society and Hispanic Executive Magazine do for our community and really kicking off and, and really coming uh, on to support this wealth creation series, kicking it off with Harvard. Um, we, we've got an excellent program. We're gonna have a lot of fun uh, on a very important topic uh, for, for our community. Uh, it's an honor for me to facilitate and moderate this first kind of kickoff session with two uh, extremely admirable leaders uh, in our community, in the business community in America. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, just go ahead and introduce, and I'm gonna start with Adela Cepeda. Uh, Adela Cepeda got her undergraduate at Harvard uh, started her career at Smith Barney uh, and, be, and, and, as a, and ended up being a vice president in their corporate finance area. She co-founded, uh, grew in an amazing way, and then sold her a financial firm, uh, Abacus Financial, uh, and then it has been on a, on a uh, her career has exploded ever since that as well. She serves on a several different boards uh, that, and I'm just going to mention a few. Uh, BMO Harris Bank, Pathway Funds, Mercer Funds, UBS Funds, Rush Medical, one that's close to me where she's a co-founder and chair, uh, Angeles Investors. So join me in welcoming Adela Sapela. Thank you. Now I'm going to introduce Luis Ubiñas. Uh, Luis is a Harvard undergrad and a Harvard MBA, and we were talking before and he's got a lot of family connections to Harvard. Uh, he, 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 him and his family bleed Harvard, Harvard red, Harvard crimson red. Uh, started his career early on as a senior, senior partner at McKinsey, uh, then was president of the Ford Foundation. Uh, a lot of board service and volunteer board service that I'll touch on. From a board service perspective, boards of AT&T, Electronic Arts, Tanger Outlets, Mercer Funds, First Mark Horizon Acquisition Corp, EBSCO, among others. And on the volunteer site, some really cool volunteer boards Luis serves on. 
the Statue of Liberty, uh, the Pan American Development Foundation, New York Public Library, uh, um, and the UN, uh, among a couple uh, a couple others. And also, he's an Angeles uh, founding member. So we have two, and I just touched on just a, a small part of their bios, and we're going to dig into a little bit deep more. Two great, admirable leaders that look forward to sharing their perspectives on wealth and, and wealth generation. So we'll, we'll start off um, with Adela. And the kind of the first question as Pedro laid out, the topic area to dig into is, you know, you didn't come from wealth, uh, you weren't born wealthy, and you have a, I touched on a parts of your life journey, but maybe you could fill, fill in that life journey, Adela, from kind of where you started, how you've grown, and kind of what wealth has meant to you in this growth. Thanks. That's really, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I think that uh, I, I'm an immigrant. I came to New York when I was six years old with my parents. And I think wealth creation was an objective of theirs in the sense that uh, they felt pinched and squeezed uh, in Colombia. Uh, they were, uh, I was born and, 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 and they lived in Barranquilla where they couldn't own a home and there were three young children having to go to uh, private school, I think they began to feel strained and connections with Americans led them to believe that coming to America, well, schooling was free, they were told. Uh, there was lots of food and it was, it was not expensive and they would just thrive here. So they came with an ambition for education, education as the answer to wealth creation and pretty much uh, pushed us very hard in that direction. As the oldest, I feel that I was pushed the hardest and uh, kind of uh, like most immigrant groups, kind of pushed towards medicine. It ended up not being uh, something to my liking, but this aspiration of more uh, of uh, uh, security, I would say more than just owning things for my parents, there was a sense of trying to be more secure financially, uh, because think about it, uh, three kids and feeling that you might not be able to afford their education, that was very threatening to them. Uh, they, they, my, my mom was uh, pretty well educated. Uh, she was ready, she was trained to be a, a a teacher uh, missed out on a scholarship to law school, but was always very education driven. My father had very little education, probably a couple of years, but always said he married my mother for her educational attainment. So education was expressed to us as an answer, a solution, a way out. And as the oldest, what I also got to see was how difficult the journey was and how important it would be to have security. Now, that is not the reason why I went to business school or anything like that. I just happened to fall into that working in, in student govern in um, a student business organization up at Harvard. Uh, um, I ran the uh, travel agency. I, I worked for AT and T in the accelerated management program. All these things I found them interesting and something that I felt I could excel at at some point. And so I that that was the that's what took me to that trajectory. But I, I will say trying to find financial security for my family was certainly an important objective. I don't know if that answers it. No, I, no, it does, Adela. That's excellent. I love the the kind of point you had on education right now, that's you, a little bit the family part of it, education and the importance there and just how uh, and your parents and kind of what they instilled in you and your family as you were kind of growing up uh, in the trajectory there. Uh, so Luis, I, I know personally know a little bit about your, your background and kind of where your family started and where you're at today. If you can walk everyone through that background, uh, I think it's very inspirational. It's in some ways very similar to Adela's, and I think very similar to many of us who are um, the children of immigrants or even immigrants ourselves. You know, my grandmother 
used to pick the meat out of tobacco leaves for a penny a pound. Um, and for me, um, like for a lot of um, children of immigrants and immigrants, it, it's uh, uh, the journey is about security and safety. The journey is about making sure that um, you have what you need, but often also that you have built enough resource so that your family can be safe, so that your brothers and sisters, parents, grandparents can be safe. And so uh, for me, this journey hasn't really been an individual journey. It's been much more collective. And I think of this all collectively. I think of it as our collective responsibility as the newest immigrants to this country. My family came in the 1940s and 50s. Um, as the newest immigrants to these kind, but uh, the Latino immigration is, of course, recent. In the last 20 and 30 years, our numbers have exploded. And we collectively, in order to be in our rightful place in this country, in order to make ourselves and our family safe, need to do wealth building. It's the path to prosperity in this country. It's the path to security. It's the path to full citizenship. Uh, I always tell people, you're only a full citizenship in the United States when you have the capacity to feed yourself and uh, make sure your family is well and safe. It is in the nature of the country. Um, that is when you achieve equality. Um, and uh, Some people get angry at me when I say that, but it's true. Uh, this is a country where you get educated and you get well, um, and then you get wealthy. Um, that is the magic of this place. Uh, that's why we all come here. That's why we've all come here. And so for me, like with uh, for Adela, uh, the grandson of someone who used to pick tobacco from, from the leaves to separate the stem from the meat, uh, the, the son of a, a woman who was a seamstress and uh, lost my father when I was in ninth grade. Um, this has been a journey toward security, a kind of collective security. Thank you. Thank you for that, Luis. And, you know, from, you know, the, the picking of tobacco to the seamstress to kind of what you've done and accomplished, both you and, and Adela from kind of where you started and where you're at. Is truly inspiring. Um, so let's kind of double click and go a little bit into um, kind of wealth wealth building, right? And your your thoughts about wealth creation. What does it mean to you? Uh, how do you do it? Why should we care, uh, Adela? Let's let's start with you. Uh, maybe double click a little bit more and, and get your thoughts there. So definitely. Again, as the oldest, I felt a lot of pressure. Uh, let me give you an example. When I graduated from Harvard in, 20, in, in 1980, my, my father had worked at least a decade at doing um, HVAC, that's what uh, heating and air conditioning for EJ Corvettes, was a big retailer, kind of like Macy's. It was in, spread out across the city of New York. That year, they went bankrupt. And... I got my first job on Wall Street and my salary was $18,000. For some reason, I had seen my parents' um, tax return and my father ha had earned $18,000, probably for financial aid. My father had earned $18,000 the year that, that I graduated with that same salary and that was without a bonus. So I don't know how they made things work because by then there were five children. We always lived with my grandmother and he was the leader of his clan in terms of bringing other relatives over from Colombia and helping to take care of them as well. And I was panicked about how would they live? How would it be? And I, I didn't live, I didn't move to New York City when I got the job in uh, on Wall Street. I lived at home because you know, it was very easy math for me. I was going to spend money on an apartment or give that money to my parents. I was going to give the money to my parents and my family. And even when I married, my husband understood that for me, helping to take care of my family was very important. Now, my parents didn't want handouts from me or anything, but I knew they wouldn't, they didn't, weren't going to be able to afford my sister's graduations, the one uh, um, education, the ones that were born in the United States. And they reminded me, one of them reminded me the other day that I had, I have, I had helped pay for that. I don't remember that, but I, I take it to be true because I felt that was a responsibility. 
And so for me, not having the worry of not having enough for basics. And remember, we were raised to believe that education was like the reason why my parents came, the reason why we were here. That was like, you know, your food, your rent, the heat, and education. And that included, you know, piano lessons, whatever it took for us to be well-rounded, well-educated kids. My parents believe fervently in that. And so I could see where things were going and I felt a, a very strong motivation to help my family and to build the kind of security. So I really have to say that for me, wealth was more about security. I just, that, that, that innate fear that there wouldn't be enough, that my father, um, there was a stretch of almost a year. Uh, I want to say it was 19, like maybe 70, 71, where he lost his job. He tried everything, even dishwashing. And it was a very scary time because they had a mortgage. By then they had five kids. So that financial insecurity drove me to want security. And now I interpret that to be wealth. That's what all these wealth departments of all these major banks is about, building up a base so that my children don't feel that insecurity, so that the rest of my family doesn't feel that insecurity. That is I consider that to be really important, not just to my family, but, you know, I think one of the major issues affecting the Latino community is that we're growing leaps and bounds, but our financial security is not growing leaps and bounds. That is the gap that we have to breach somehow, and there are strategies for doing it. You know, I think that's an excellent quote, Adela, and for those who are tweeting and social media, right? We are gr growing by leaps and bounds, right? But our financial security is not growing by, by leaps and bounds, right? So I think that's a, a, you know, a, great, a great quote and something that why we're doing this series and why we need everybody on this call to kind of chip in there. Um, Luis, uh, your, your perspective, you know, your philosophy on wealth building, any tips, ideas, things that we can share with the audience here? Yeah. So uh, I, I um, you know, I don't know the age range of this audience. I'll assume it's distributed across all ages. But I think um, that how one thinks about wealth building drives whether or not wealth building will happen or not. I always ask myself, what are my goals? What, what do I want to be able to do? I want to be able to ha have a house. I want to be able to... Um, pay for my children's college. I want to, I want to, I want to, these handful of things. I want to be able to help my nieces and nephews, for example. And what I do is I clearly delineate the pools I want to fill. And I did this at a very early age. The sooner you do it, the better. And sometimes when you're, when you're 22, if there's anyone 22, that pool might be paying off your student loan. When you're uh, 45, it might be putting away money for your kid's schooling, whatever it might be at whatever age. But I ask myself from a very early age, exactly why am I saving? If you're just saving to amorphously build wealth, your ability to save maximally is gonna be diminished because you're always gonna say, but what is it I'm saving for? If you can give yourself the answer, um, I'm saving for X. Maybe the answer ultimately is I'm saving for multi-generational wealth. I'm saving so that I can look in my grandkids' eyes the day they're born and say, I don't know what you're going to choose to do or how capable you're going to be, but I have you covered, right? That might be the end point of how you think about wealth. At the beginning, it might be, I've got a bunch of student loans and I want to be able to pay those off. And so I think mission one is to define why you're saving. I used to be on the board of a company and we used to call this the why of wealth. Um, so ask why. Then I would save into those pools. It might be that you're saving into a pool to buy a house. It might be that you're saving into a pool to pay off your loan. It might student loans. It might be that you're saving into a pool for retire. Or it might be that you're saving into a pool because you want to make sure that your grandchildren are well. So and then the risk tolerance and the time frame for each of those things will be different. So if you define your pools, you 
then have a reason why you are not spending today's dollar in order to be better off tomorrow. And then every one of those pools can have its own unique investment strategy. Because what you're going to do to invest money that you're going to need to buy a house next year is different from what you're going to do if you're investing money that isn't going to be spent in your lifetime. Just and maybe Adela, is there any additional things or tips or tricks or things that you have found useful in how you've been able to invest or save or build generational wealth that you'd like to add, if any? Yes, I, I really do, Dave. Thanks for coming back. You asked about are there any tips? Well, one of the things my parents did very early on was save enough and, and and they got this information they lived on riverside drive and there was a thriving latino community a mishmash of puerto rican cuban dominican and you know the beginnings of the south american brain drain that moved over there and somebody told them you don't need all the money to buy a house you just need a down payment and my mom was really smart and she saved I don't know how, because she wasn't working at the time, but with what my father made, and I don't know, she, they saved for a down payment on a little house in Queens. And then they sold that to buy a bigger house on Long Island. Ultimately, that's, their, that's the inheritance they left us, the house. But it's a, it's a very strong message because that is what differentiates familial wealth in America is really home ownership is the core of it. And it is why, again, we as a community, we are behind because we lost a lot in the recession where so many people lost their houses or, you know, um, weren't able to, to keep the mortgage. And we just don't happen since then recovered such that our family net worth is still significantly lower than white American families. So that's something when I hear that the younger generation, oh, they don't really believe in home ownership and they don't want to. Uh, no, that's a mistake. We need to believe in home ownership because that has been the tenet of American wealth. And then there's something else that I believe in. And early in my marriage, my husband said, well, why don't we get a policy, a life insurance policy for you? And I thought, yeah, but why? And he said, well, you know, I've had policies since I was a little kid. And it's just, you know, it's just for security. Well, it was fine. You know, it wasn't onerous. And every time we had children, my husband increased his policy. And I'm a widow for over 25 years. Uh, when, when Albert died at 40, I, I had three children, four, six, and eight. And the, the last one, she wasn't even a year old when he was diagnosed with a terminal cancer. And he had already increased his life insurance. And, you know, that gave me the security to be in business what I am today. I would not have been able to continue on the entrepreneurial streak, new business building that I was on without the security of <coughs> of that policy that he left that allowed us to stay in our home, allowed me to, you know, rebuild and not worry because there, there was, there were sufficient resources there. And since then, obviously if a young a, a person can die at 40, I, it could happen to me too. I boosted up my insurance as well, having three young kids. And that has become a central part of my, wealth accumulation. And I know people say, oh, it's not efficient. It's not. Well, let me tell you, when there's an incident, an event that you don't expect, life insurance comes through. And so I, I believe very strongly in it. So those are two tips. No, that's that's great. And, you know, and I'll, I'll just summarize a couple of points. And then Luis, if there's anything additional you want to add, um, you know, please, you know, share your thoughts here. But we, you know, you we talked a little bit about assets and building assets, right? Adela touched on home ownership, right, and, and that being a kind of the foundation and how you build wealth in, 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 in through home ownership or real estate as, as another uh, 
Luis touched on goals and, and where you want to position and, and put put different um, put your wealth or your wealth accumulation. The why, like why are you building wealth? What do you want to use it for? It was it was indirectly touched on, but leverage, right? Financial leverage as a tool to build wealth, and that's in the case with you know as Adela was talking about the home and saving it all or leveraging the bank's money to build that wealth, right? And there's other cases where you can do that. And then there was, you know, some uh, family focus and, and focus on different areas of the family. And the other, you know, vehicle, whether it's insurance, life insurance, there's another area where you've seen other people look uh, to, you know, whether it's the, the insurance side of it or even the wealth building side of that, or just a couple uh, kind of a summary points around there. Luis, any additional things before we jump to the next segment that you, you want to add? Yeah, all I'd add is, you know, we live in a time where um, it, there's a hostility to the idea of accumulating wealth, of saving, of building security, where, you know, lots of people think we should be distracted by other things. We saw it last summer. And um, I think it's important for our community to give itself permission to not fall into those traps. Our community to be focused on raising itself up economically, um, saving, building businesses, building worth, building assets, investing. Because at the end of the day, that's the path to progress in, in this country. And if we want to bring social justice to our community, then we need to build wealth and make sure that we're bringing those closest to us along with us. Because if every family has someone who creates substantive wealth and they bring along their brothers and sisters and help a little bit beyond that, we as a community will be well off one or two generations from now. It is as simple as that. Amen. Well put, well put, Luis. So now when we think about generational wealth, wealth building, there's a lot of different assets out there, a lot of different things where we can put our money in, invest and save. Um, I want to I want to specifically uh, maybe just maybe you can touch on just the broad that broad statement and you know where, where do you put your assets? But I want to focus in on this early stage asset class, right? Early stage venture tech startups, um, which has gotten a lot of attention over the last several years, let's say, and, and just focusing on that as, asset class as a tool to build generational wealth. Um, Adela, let's start with you, kind of just your general thoughts on asset classes and, and that specific asset class. Well, I had a better understanding of equities because I worked in investment banking and took a lot of companies public, and I saw the immense wealth that was created when a company went public, which is, you know, the exit strategy, uh, one of the exit strategies. And back in the 80s, the key exit strategy was going public, more so than um, uh, selling to a private equity firm. That's That kind of happened later. So I did see that and um, <clears throat> took, uh, took that to... Um, um, in terms of my investments, they had a strong, strong focus on equities. I just saw that what, what can happen with uh, equities. And I made those, you know, another core part of my retirement. Uh, any, any money I had, it would always be in equities. I, I wasn't um, that interested in fixed income. In uh, the, the 2010 crisis, 2009 or eight uh, crises, I chaired the uh, investment and finance committee for one of the leading uh, community foundations here in Chicago. And that was the first time I came to appreciate bonds. We had everything. We had every kind of asset class and, you know, fixed income really did well. But the recovery of the non-public, uh, the, 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 the privately held investments like uh, private equity and venture was incredible. It took a little bit longer 
but then they fully recovered and with a lot of strength. So I learned a lot from that. I had invested in, in uh, some vent, a venture fund earlier, like 1995. I invested a bit in that. Uh, but when the opportunity came to invest in Latino businesses, this resonated to me in a way that very few other things did. Uh, you know, always wanting to do more for our community, but there finding a way to actually put dollars behind a community that I know is inherently entrepreneurial. We have to make do with so much less and we do, and not just in the United States, you know, in Latin America, we are just trying to find a way to succeed financially. And that indicated to me that this was a community that I didn't just believe in because it's a part of me, but also that it had some of the essentials for succeeding in business startups. And that's really why I was so motivated with David to and, and others to co-found uh, Angeles Investors. I think there's an opportunity to help and there's an, an opportunity for incredible returns as well. So it's, it's very rewarding. Thank you, Adela. Uh, Luis, your thoughts on assets in general in this early stage uh, asset class? This gets to this gets to my earlier comment, and that is that um, how you invest is really driven by what age you are and what you're uh, saving for, and um, your risk profile changes based on those things. So, for example, if you were saving for um, retirement, then uh, to Adela's point. Um, riskier assets are, 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 are more viable for you. If you're saving for the house you want to buy 36 months from now, you know, markets may not be the right thing um, to be in short term, especially when they're at inflated values like they are now, but that's a whole other thing. Um, my point is you have to match where you are in your life journey, what you're saving for with the risk profile of the assets you're putting in those pools. And the idea that you just have a big pile of money is really a flawed one. You've got to think about your assets in terms of what they're planned for. Now, let me talk about um, private investments um, like Angelis is part of. Um, the thing to remember about early stage investing, is it, and this is a trope that everyone hears, but it's important to remember. Um, private investments are... Uh, highly illiquid. Um, even the best investors, they'll always tell you six out of the 10 investments go to zero value. Uh, two or three of 10 give you back your money and only one of 10 yields a positive return. Now with that one of 10 yields a very high positive return theoretically and more than makes up for the neutral or negative returns on the other 10. Now, so that's a terrific asset class. If you were investing your 10th million dollars or your 20th or your fifth, depending on your risk tolerance. But um, you have to be ready and able to understand that it is an illiquid, high risk asset class. And so it has to sit in your portfolio at the point in your life and in the pool of, of savings goals that is appropriate for that level of risk asset. It's an important thing. It yields very good returns. And it, 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 a lot of it has to do with market cycles. And by the way, you don't know what the return is until you liquidate the asset because lots and lots of private investments get marked up and up and up and up. But until they liquidate, until someone sends you a check, you don't really know what the return is. We learned those lessons the hard way in 2000 and 2001 when paper profits vanished across the economy and we had serious issues uh, across the economy because of it. So what I'm saying is think about everything that's been said before. Why are you saving and what are those specific pools? Translate your why into your pools. And then each of those pools create a portfolio plan inside those pools. Make sure they work with each other, but make sure that what's happening inside those pools also works. 
your, your housing pool, to Adela's point, it's important to own a home. Your education pool, as you know, the future of your children and everyone you love is driven almost exclusively by education. Your uh, retirement pool, you need to be safe, again, an Adela point. Uh, your wealth building pool and your generational um, security pool, much longer term, much more likely to be a place where you can take more risk. So think about those basic lessons and those basic tools. They'll hold you in good stead. Thank you, Luis. And we are kind of getting ready to gear up for q and I, I seen a couple good questions out there in the comments, but, but before we jump in there, any additional last points that you want to add Adela or Luis, Adela, I'll start with you. So I, I would say that um, for sure, uh, the private equity investments, because of their liquidity, they cannot be the core of your investment. Uh, and generally, they are not. Like I saw how in the trust and the endowment, they're a very small part. And the the what we are trying to do with Angeles is democratize it so that cre by creating these vehicles, it allows um, uh, accredited investors, because to your point, Luis, you have to be accredited, you have to be sophisticated, and you have to have a certain amount of net worth in order to invest in these. But we allow you to invest small amounts, which would never be offered to you in the real world without us as intermediaries. Because, you know, startups and everyone, they want, they want a million dollar investment. They don't want a 10,000 or 5,000 investment. So it's a great way to diversify because you don't have to make it a $50,000 investment. You can have 10, $5,000 investments in 10 um, startups that we've curated where the, uh, the, the chance of success is kind of heightened because we've do, done some of the screening for you. So I, I, I love it. I love, I wish this had been available uh, to me earlier in this way uh, because it's just such a great opportunity for us to participate in an asset class that has been pretty much devoted to institutions and the very, very high net worth individual. Thank you. Thank you, Adela. Luis, any other thoughts you want to share before we jump into Q&A? I would support what Adela said. Angeles really represents for the person who is saving in the right pool and is at the right stage in his life. Angeles represents an excellent opportunity to participate in an asset class that most people don't have access to. Thank you. Well, well put there, Luis. Um, so let's jump into Q&A. Um, thanks to those who've put some questions out there uh, in the chat. Uh, we are willing to take more. So if you have questions, continue to put those out there. Uh, we'll start with uh, Miguel. Uh, Miguel, thanks for putting the question out there. It says, hey, I struggle with the, no with the notion of generational wealth, not because I don't believe in it and not because I don't understand it, but because I'm not sure if I can claim that being a first generation American after my parents struggling with their entire lives, attending school to the, the third and the sixth grade, how can I ever begin to have that conversation with my parents? I don't feel entitled to what they have, but is this a conversation I should be having with them, with them and my three other siblings? Uh, Adele, I'll start with you. I do think it's a conversation to have with parents. Like I remember when uh, an insurance uh, salesman came to the house, to talk to my parents and they really did understand it, but it was just unaffordable to them. But I wish I had been older and could have explained more, could have helped them with it. Uh, I think there are many ways that we can help uh, to simplify, demystify some um, instruments of wealth accumulation uh, that, that are just hard to understand. So I, I, I do think it's important. And it's interesting that you bring your parents up because of course I was thinking about generational wealth looking forward like to my kids. Uh, but I do think we have an opportunity to bring our parents along. Definitely siblings. I, I yes, totally. I've, I've been engaged with my 
siblings on many, many issues involving wealth building. And of course, my children. And, you know, for them, what I feel is most important is to leave them with an education. And I always tell them, if there's anything extra left over, good for you. But I intend to, you know, make a dent uh, and, and, and live it up while I'm still here and while I can. Uh, I've left them with a great education and they should take it from there, if that's, if that's what you meant. Thanks, Thanks Adela. Uh, Luis. You know, that, that's a really, it's in some ways a really lovely question. I want to thank Miguel for asking it. So um, when you think about these questions, you ask them at different stages of your life. And Miguel, I, I don't know how old you are, but um, I, I think what you have to do is give yourself permission to be well off, right? Um, and, you know, I don't know how many people you need to have that conversation with, but giving yourself permission to be well off. And when you think about pools, you know, think about a pool that says you're going to be successful, but maybe your siblings aren't as successful. And one of the things you can do is help them pay for college, help them later on buy a house, help them with their own children's education. Because as you become more successful, if you've done a good job at managing your career and your income and your savings, you're going to be able to um, help back, help your parents maybe buy their first house. I don't know what your personal circumstances are, but uh, think of things as looking forward and looking backward. Looking back, making sure the people who brought you to where you are are well and giving yourself permission to be so successful, so well off, so um, safe that you can extend that safety back to your parents and your siblings as a dream, as an aspiration when you're young and then as a reality when you're older. And then think about being so successful that having done that, you can look forward and create safety for your children and maybe even if you're really lucky, their children. And so, Miguel, again, I don't know where you are from an age point of view or where you sit in the age construct of your family, but if I were, say, when I was, say, 26, um, the eldest in my generation, I looked back and made sure that I was doing things to even then help my brothers and sisters. And um, my mother had passed away by then, so it was just me with them. Um, and as I've progressed through life, they've progressed with me. I've made sure of that. Um, at the same time, I look forward and think about the well-being of my children um, and, and God willing, uh, their children. So I, I think, think of it, depending on where you are in that, in that age category, as um, looking back and looking forward and thinking about how you can motivate yourself. You can bring enough success to yourself that um, in the spirit of our community, which is really a community, a family, in a deep, profound way. If you're not, let, if you don't care about family, you, I don't know where you are culturally in our, in our, in our, among our people. I know you do because your question implies it. Think of it as reaching back and reaching forward at the same time, and doing that by building yourself and building your own resources. Thanks, Luis. The uh, and you talk about family and community. It kind of goes to this next question here from Armando. Are there any thoughts on how we, you know, we being capitalized, can collaborate to lift all boats within our community? Uh, you, you know, there's home ownership, saving, other strategies that tend to focus on wealth within one family, perhaps. But I'm wondering how we can effectively pool resources if possible with the community. Adela. Well, Angeles Investors is one way. I mean, that, that's what we're doing. We're pulling resources to lift a startup that we believe has real business possibility of succeeding. And we're not only adding financial resources to it, but we're connecting them. We're sitting on their boards and helping to guide them. We're opening doors everywhere we can. So that is, that is one way that I found to be to help me meet that goal of helping lift the broader boat, the broader community. Thank you. Uh, Luis? You know, um, this is going to be a strict answer. Um, but sometimes 
the collective and communal is the individual. Uh, mil tens of millions of us have arrived in this country. The country was 5% Latino and Latina. Notice I don't use the phrase Latinx, which is of course ridiculous. Um, but 5% uh, of the country was Latino and Latina when I showed up in the country, when I was 10 in 1973. It is uh, the 10 year old today, so it's a country that is 26% Latino or Latina among 10 year olds. We will be successful collectively if we are successful individually. The typical person who is a Latina or Latino is literally in their early 20s. They're not in a position to do a huge bunch of stuff for society. And God knows we don't want them out in the street causing trouble. They need to be in school, and at work, making money and saving it and using that money for the well-being of their families and their children. To the extent to which there's a surplus beyond that, I'm speaking to the reality of the situation, by the way. To the extent which there's a surplus beyond that for these people who are typically young, the age of my children, 24 and 26, um, then terrific. But in our community, we have to make sure that we are moving forward individually in order to move forward together. By the way, when you get to be 59 and you know have freaky knees, it all changes. I, 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 then you can be giving away money. Then you can be supporting all sorts of causes. Then you can pay for scholarships at the parochial school in your old neighborhood in the South Bronx, the way I do. You can do all sorts of things. But when you're in these early stages of your career, when you've got those first feet on the path to prosperity and success, you've got to make sure that you are focused on being as successful as you can be so that you can reach back and reach forward and then someday have enough surplus and you can make a real difference in helping others beyond those groups. Thank you, Luis. And thank you, Adela, there. Uh, so next question comes from analyst member Mikael Velasco. Any thoughts on, on wealth creation and its relation to contacts and connections and the network? I would also add there, uh, Adela. So I hear people say uh, something about luck, uh, but, you know, luck that you're at the right place at the right time. But a lot of that also is your own ability to figure out what are what are the areas of growth what are and, and to be around that uh, I think that um, connections have something to do with it I, I think that because I met David and others and we hit upon this idea you know I'm pretty lucky but we also put a lot of work into it and we continue to work intensely on it. So I don't know, to the outside world, it might seem like, oh my gosh, she's lucky she was there. You work on these things a lot to try to figure out the angle of success. Uh, I think that there are people that have run, you know, like through their network, uh, found out about a startup and maybe they got hired and then it got sold. And But again, uh, this is somebody with some skill that was attractive. Don't undermine the value of your skills. And don't undermine, of course, the value of connecting with individuals that expand your thinking. That is really what is most valuable. That, you know, every time I'm, I talk to all the people involved with this uh, conversation, I learn something I'm connected to someone else. I I I'm I'm I I advance, uh, and that is just phenomenal. And will it lead to greater dollars and cents? I don't know. Uh, you know, those are objectives you set in a certain way and for certain things. Uh, and then there's the overall need to connect with others that share common goals common aspirations and have great intellect that that is that's fabulous to be around 
Thank you. Thank you, Della. Uh, Luis, uh, wealth creation as it relates to contacts, connections, and network. You know, so words like contacts, connections, and network always make me uh, nervous. I, I think about the community of people I work with. Um, someone said, you know, how is it that um, you end up with a disproportionate number of successful uh, activities? And I said, well, it really doesn't have a lot to do with me. It has to do with the fact that I uh, only associate with people who I hold in high esteem, people who are sometimes usually smarter than I am, often harder working, um, uh, who are more creative. I look for people to bring into my community of people. And I'll tell you what the difference is between a connection and a community in a second, who are better than I am in some way. I remember meeting Adela. I remember meeting you, but I'll sp speak to Adela. I remember meeting Adela and thinking, I don't really know who this is yet, but I really want to get to know her better because there's something magic about her. And I want to find out what that magic thing is. Adele, I don't know if you remember, but we were at Bar Pleiades on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, just off of Madison Avenue, next to uh, uh, some place, and um, uh, Boulud, and um, Cafe Boulud. And you and I sat there and we had a drink and I literally was like, I don't know who this is, but I'm going to do something with her and I'm going to keep doing things with her because she is a special person. And here you are a f five or six years later and you started on this investors and it's going to be incredibly successful. So um, why do I think of that not as a connection, but as a community? Why? Because then a year or two later, maybe a year or two before I meet David and David and Adela know each other and I know both of them. And so are those connections or are those a community? And by the way, we then know all manner of people who know all three of us. And so if you don't think of connections, th connections are like a hub with a bunch of spokes coming out of it. Don't think of it that way. Think of it as the rim of a wheel. And think of everyone you know as being along that rim. And your job is to create a circular communication across all those people. If our community, can be engaged, community, can be engaged together in sharing its most interesting endeavors. Almost, uh, I was gonna say a week, a week doesn't go by, but the reality is two or three days don't go by without my sending some opportunity to someone. Because I exist in this community and where I am in the community gives me the opportunity to shed opportunities to others. And so, I think connections are good and our community should do a great job at having connections, but I'd much rather have us think about community so that if you're 45 and have opportunities that aren't right for you anymore, because they're the opportunities for someone 10 years younger, you don't say no to those, you send someone to them. So that if you're 59, nearly 60, like I am, and there are many opportunities that come your way, there are amazing opportunities, but either you don't have the capacity for, or, or maybe they're not right for you at that stage, that you're not sending them away, but you're passing them on to somebody else in your community. That's a very different thing than contacts and connections and network, right? That's about a group of people who are working to advance each other. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. And, you know, I would say there's there's a, the Spanish saying, dime con quien andas, right? I think that what a lot of us know, and you whether it's Taz or Angeles Investors, right, we're all helping each other. In a lot of aspects, it's a team sport uh, in terms of how you invest or once you invest, how do you help? Um, so I think that would be the only additional thing uh, I would add there. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, from... V, Viviana, uh, how did you begin to build your wealth? Who mentored you? I mean, that's, I think that's a good one. Like who, who was maybe your wealth management or your wealth growth mentor, if any, uh, and what resources helped you build the wealth? So Adela, we'll, we'll start with you. Well, I was lucky in that I started in investment banking and it was at Smith Barney and they have you know, the investment banking, corporate finance area. But it, right next to it is was the retail brokerage. And everybody there had an account with their with a broker that was dedicated to us. 
And so it gave me ready access to research on stocks, research on trends in the market. I, I, I had a, a paid education on wealth accumulation and people that were motivated to help me succeed because they get paid, you know, sometimes based on the amount of assets you have. So that, that was how I, I got oriented uh, to, to that. And, um, you know, my, my, I, uh, my husband was African-American. He was about third or fourth generation college uh, educated. And his family, uh, his father had been an MBA from um, University of Pennsylvania. So they had a pretty good understanding. My husband had a pretty good understanding about wealth and what it meant and the security that it brought. And I learned a lot from him, to be honest, and his family. Thank you, Adela. Uh, Luis, your, met, your kind of wealth mentor. Yeah. You know, the best advice I got about wealth building came when I was in my first job after business school. I was in with a senior partner at McKinsey. I was the most junior person. I just arrived at McKinsey. I couldn't have been more junior since I was brand new. And we're in the car and he said, hey, listen, you're going to do really well here. I'm going to give you some financial advice. I said, what's that? He says, I want you this year to save 20% of your income. And then every year from now on, I want you to save half your raise. And I want you to do that until you say you're saving half your income. I said, wow, okay, great. I can, that's simple. I can do that. And uh, so I started saving 20% of my income the year before I was a student. So like 80%. I was at zero. So 80% of what I was making as a young associate at McKinsey was 100% more than I had a month before. So it wasn't hard to do. And then every raise, I didn't have that raise the year before. I had zero of that raise. So keeping half the raise was awesome too. Um, and so I followed that advice and um, from the beginning. And the thing with wealth building is it begins with saving. People forget that. You know, the simple answer to becoming wealthy is you have to save because you can't invest if you don't save. My, my second mentor um, said, you're not going to use this money ever. So you should just put all the money that you don't need to buy your house in equities. And by the way, not fancy equities. You should never pick a stock because you're not smart enough to pick stocks. It's true. Um, instead, just put it in simple, diversified ETF-like vehicles. By the way, when you get a little bit older, you'll have other equity opportunities and you'll use them. But for now, you're you know, 28, 30, do this. And lo and behold, the power of compounding relentlessly for 40 years can take the $50,000 you invested when you were 26 and 27 and have it become half a million or three quarters of a million dollars decades later. So my strong, strong advice to folks is to take those two bits of advice, two bits of advice, find the formula that works for you. For me, it was 20% and 50%, 20% of what I made that first year. And then 50% of every race, everyone else might have a different number. That's what he told me. So that's what I did. And no one else in my family knew anything about this stuff. So uh, my naivete, led me to just sit, do whatever he said. If he'd said something else, I'd have done that. And then the other bit of advice, which is if you're young, um, invest and invest even more when markets are down. That was the third bit of advice. I, I worked at the Wall Street Journal when I was really young, like 21 or something like that. And uh, this guy who went on to become legendary turned to me uh, he was 30 at the time, so he wasn't yet legendary, turned to me and he said, you know, I only invest after disasters. <laughs> He's like, when markets are down 20 or 25%, I just put all the chips on the table and then they might fall another five or 10%, but boy, it's so great to keep buying things at a 25% discount. That guy who I still know has made tens of millions of dollars as a writer um, by taking money out when things are at record levels and putting them back in. It's, it's on the one hand market timing, which you're not supposed to do. But on the other hand, what harm comes from going into something when it's 30% off? 
Um, I'll, I'll tell you one last anecdote on this. Well, in, in March of 20, in March or April of 2020, uh, uh, 20, uh, a financial advisor calls me up, not someone I work with, and said, oh, you know, you should be, I'm giving you good advice for free. You should be out of the market at this point. And I said, oh, that seems strange because the market's down 32%. And he says, well, what do you think you should be doing? I said, well, I'm actually putting everything in. I, I'm out of cash because I, I don't have enough money to pay the Con Ed bill tomorrow because I have invested everything. And he's like, well, why would you have done that? I said, because 32% off. I've been waiting for this. And he shakes his head. Of course, the market's doubled since then, um, more than doubled since then. Um, and um, people who sell into downturns instead of buying uh, into downturns, uh, once downturns have gotten bad, miss out on opportunities. So those are the three bits of advice my mentors have given me. 50-20, rather 20-50. Um, don't be afraid of risk if it's a long-term holding. And there's beauty in catastrophic declines. Thank you. Thank you there, Adela, for that uh, on the mentoring answer. Luis, thank you for that and the summary there. Uh, we are we are out of time, so I'm going to just do a, a, a quick a quick wrap. Uh, I want to thank everyone for jumping on uh, this first session where we've kicked it off. We're going to do more throughout the year with different TAS, Alumni Society Universities. And uh, I really want to give a warm thank you to Pedro and, and the Alumni Society, not only for all they do, but really partnering uh, with uh, Angeles Investors to kick off this series. A couple different events that just want to make you all aware of. Uh, on the 17th and 18th of February, Angeles Investors has an event in Miami. Uh, we also, if you're interested in finding out more about Angeles, please visit our website uh, where you can find out more or email us at members at angelesinvestors.com. And then uh, the Alumni Society is going to be kicking off again their in-person leadership summit. Uh, it's going to be June 23rd. So put that date in your calendars. I believe it's going to be in New York, but we'll find out more, more details on where that's going to be. So with that, again, thank you, everybody. A lot of great nuggets of information here to help, help you in your wealth building journey. And let's, uh, let's keep in touch. Thank you.